possessing a healthy mind. Uh, tonight's talk is around re-establishing trust and, and intimacy in relationships. Now, I lead with the idea of being a mind and body coach, the, the idea of a work-life balance is that what happens outside of work and outside of those non-negotiable eight hours of sleep is life. And what you do in those eight hours of life, which is leisure, if you like, uh, is what leads to a happy life and a life of balance. Um, I'm assuming most of us, given as high-performance fathers, are fathers. And in order to be fathers, then those children must have mothers. In a lot of cases, uh, some of the fellows out there are, are here because they want to be better fathers and they want to be better partners. And there's a, there's a fine line between the two. Um, I've, I've had uh, men tell me that their wives would say, sometimes I wish I was your daughter because you are a better father. You're better to the children. You treat the children better than you actually treat me. Uh, interestingly enough, children have unconditional love. People like having pets because pets love you unconditionally. You come home and the dogs will jump all over you. You come home and the kids are daddy's home. And that's all very well and good. And the trust and the intimacy kind of fails in a lot of cases because mummy doesn't get up off the lounge and go, hubby's home. And so there's where there is a bit of a disconnect. Now, for mine, when I say re-establishing trust, trust is the basis of every relationship uh, on the planet, whether it's a business relationship uh, or a friendship, they're, they're born and made on, on trust. I say the word trust for mine means your ability to, one, be truthful. People will trust people who are truthful. When I'm dealing with somebody and they say, oh, trust me, man, trust me, I think I've got to watch this bloke because he's just told me I should trust him about seven times. It's, it's as I say to my female clients that I coach, when a man is saying to you, hey, I'll never hit you, Amanda, or I'll never lie to you, Catherine, and you know, I promise you I will always do this, they shouldn't have to reaffirm to you something they've never done for you unless it's a habit that they've had before. So the idea that the truth will set you free is... It's very, very true. And the idea of truth, uh, trust being to be truthful to start with, the second thing is to be reliable. People will trust you if you always do what you say you will do. So I've got a bit of wind as in air coming through the room. It's blowing. It's a blustery uh, evening here in Sydney. Um, but the idea that you are reliable is how trust is established. Now I'm going to talk about re-establishing trust, but in the first place, how you establish trust, and it's having an understanding, an understanding of where you both stand in the relationship to, in order for trust to have been established. Again, trust is something that comes from a steadiness. It is consistent. People like people who are reliable and steady, and they trust people who are reliable and steady. And I think what I'm doing here is I'm spelling a word, and the word is trust. The T is truth, the R is reliability, the U is understanding, the S is steadiness, and the last T, again, is trust, as in trust the process. So in order for you to reestablish trust, you actually have, have to have had a basis, basis from where to go to or from in the first place. Now, as a mind and body coach, when I say I work with the mind and the body, the those of you out there now, from a trust perspective, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was the last time I spoke and I talked around sending off, I was on holidays at the time, and I had said, anybody who wants my template on how to set goals around mental, physical, spiritual, social, financial, family, business, and romance, just send me an email. I will always reply and I'll get back to you. And I had a raft of emails come through and I responded to a raft of emails. And only tonight in reconnecting uh, online back at my place, I realised I have a boatload of emails sitting in my drafts that for some reason cannot and won't be sent. So I will send those all out tomorrow. I've got a bunch of emails that I've got to send out, which are those templates. And again, at the end of this talk, if anybody wants to uh, 
get some of the show notes, so to speak, or some of the templates that I speak of, just email me, david at leeway.com.au, and I'll send those to you, trust being the first one. So let's just say from a physical perspective, you're trying to reestablish the purpose behind how you're going to get a fitness campaign off the ground. Well, first, you have to have a plan. You have to understand where that plan will fit within your life. You have to review, renew, reset, reframe your approach to fitness in the past, where you've gone wrong, when you've gone off the track, where your weaknesses are. The P in purpose is people. Who are the people around you that keep bringing you down, that keep derailing your plans? You want to quit smoking, you can't hang out with smokers because in order for smokers to make you feel like one of the gang or for you not to make them feel so bad about themselves, they say, come on, man, just, just have a drink, just have a, a smoke while we're drinking, just tonight. So be careful of the people you're hanging around as far as that's concerned. The O in purpose is optimism, so you have to have a belief that your fitness campaign is going to get back on track. The S is what are the solutions, what are the steps you could take, so let's just start with a walk. I say to people, just start, get out of bed in the morning and do 50 air squats and 50 push-ups. Now, you don't have to do them in a row, but do them over the course of the day. And the E is what is the most effective way to go about your fitness program, whether it is walking, whether it is cycling, whether it's low impact, whether it's swimming, whatever it is, just take the first step. Now, if you want to look at trust in a relationship or re-establishing trust, let's put purpose the purpose mnemonic to the test in that regard. So, okay, the P, what's the plan? Well, the plan is to re-establish trust. So you go, okay, prior proper planning prevents poor performance. Benjamin Franklin said, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Now, in a trusting relationship, you have obviously failed in the case that the trust has been lost. Now, whatever it is, you know that, and your partner knows that, and it might even be your children who you've lost trust, who have lost trust in your broken promises. So when I say, okay, what's your plan for re-establishing trust? The first question I always ask anybody before you start anything is, why do you want this? So why do you want to re-establish trust or gain trust in the first instance? And the whys are the windows to your goals. So why is it? that you want to re-establish trust because I love my partner. I really love her. I love, I love what we had. I loved who we were. I didn't, you know, trust doesn't necessarily mean or trust isn't necessarily lost through what everybody thinks is the number one infidelity. It's not necessarily the number one. Trust could be, well, you sold me a dud. When I, as I say, if you treat the relationship at the end like you do at the beginning, like you did at the beginning, there will be no end. If you... You know, you, you showered your partner with flowers. You took her out on date night. You did your month's pay on a, on a diamond earrings or handbags and all those things that you hooked her in. And then from then on in, you're using plastic lures and expecting to catch the same attention or have the same attraction that you had in the earliest stages of desire. And love and desire, ask your wives if, I can, if they can confirm this or your partners, Love and desire are two separate things. Our partners love our children. Desire is a different thing. The reason out, the idea that love is an action, whereas desire is an idea. And our desire is something that you build up. So from a planning perspective, what's the first thing you could do? Take a minute to begin it. What's the first step you could take? What could you do to plan around re-establishing trust in the relationship? Okay, so... Sorry means you won't do it again. My first and foremost thing I would suggest is that you actually apologize and you give an honest and an absolutely fully owning what it is you're apologizing for. Um, I don't know whether any of you blokes watch um, Married at First Sight or Maps. I watched uh, The Bachelor and Married at First Sight with my daughters as they were growing up. They're now 24, 20, 20, 24 and 23. And I watch that mainly to give them an idea on how the world works. You know, it's better that they see some punk treat a woman badly on television than a punk treat her, my children, badly. Now, the greatest way you can establish trust in your daughter's eyes on how to treat, how they should be treated by a man is how you treat their mother. How to act as a man is how they, what they will look for 
in a man. Your sons, how your sons will treat women is how they see you treat their mother. If you have sons who have sisters and they hit their sisters, you have to come down on them like a ton of bricks because the pushing and the shoving of today, as you might have seen in the domestic violence ads, is the hitting and the pushing of the future of men. Boys become men. Socrates said, show me the boy between the ages of 0 and 7 and I'll show you the man. If you have a son between the ages of 0 and 7 who's hitting his sister, put an end to that right now and you tell him all of the reasons why and the consequences behind why that is a bad thing. So from that, from that perspective, planning in that regard is say sorry from the outset for what it is that you've done, taking complete ownership. The reason I mentioned maths is I watched, uh, uh, you know, nine now, a bit of a catch-up, which you can do if you're not watching the show. But of a Sunday night, tonight, they all sit on the lounge and they say where they're going to stay or go. Now, it might be seen as such a frivolous, stupid thing to watch, but there are three psychiatrists or psychologists, rather, who watch the play and the behaviour of these characters, the couples. And they bring up words such as gaslighting and, and narcissism and negging and all these sort of things that the men do to the women and sometimes the women do to the men. But there was a fellow recently who kissed one of the other girls and he had to come clean because uh, he was going to be outed and his entire excuse was alcohol and he just blamed this and blamed that and he just kept, he didn't own it. Now, the woman who was involved in it made a very, very heartfelt apology she was so apologetic to the point of tears and it wasn't bluff. And she wrote a very long letter to the man over how she had made him feel. She took full responsibility for how she made him feel. She didn't say, I'm sorry, you feel this way. She said, I'm so sorry, I made you feel this way. She took complete ownership and honesty in her part in the situation. Now, it was that fellow who she had wronged it was his decision on whether he believed her, trusted her, and forgave her. So in the first instance, if we look at romance and re-establishing trust, what's your plan? Now, if you've lost trust, my first plan to you would be to write down, write a letter of apology. The truth is rarely heard, only seen, Balthazar Gracian said. People, Mayor Angelo said, people never remember what you said, they'll never remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. Now, in cases of infidelity or in cases of a breach of trust, people remember what you said and they'll remember what you did and they'll remember how you made them feel. So you've got a lot of work to do on re-establishing that trust. So there's your plan. Write your plan down. What is it that you're going to do? Where are you going to have this conversation? It's not going to be on the fly. It's going to be where everybody is 100% present. Uh, I spoke to a couple today and... The woman had said, and this seems to happen to me a lot, where couples will talk to me and my partner about their relationship. And they'll give examples of where their relationship is out of whack. And they'll say things. And it's almost like they're dobbing on each other to me. They know what I do for a living. Um, and as much as I am not a relationship coach, I'm a life coach. And when I say to people, if you love life, you'll love time because time is what life is made up of. Now, Bruce Lee said that, but time is our greatest commodity. And you show love as an action to your partner by the time that you give her. Now, I know you blokes talk about the five love languages. And one of those love languages, as I always say, I assume she's all five. You know, your partner may be one of quality time, but it doesn't mean that acts of service don't mean something to her doesn't mean that gift giving doesn't mean anything to it. It doesn't mean that um, words of affirmation don't mean things to her. And it doesn't mean the physical touch doesn't mean things to her. If you've identified through asking or witnessing that your wife's love language is quality time, then yes, give it to her in space, but do come through with the other four. So then, but in the respect of reestablishing trust, quality time has to be an absolute given in that you take quality time and space within which to have those conversations. Now, as I say, losing trust doesn't mean infidelity in every case. Your, your partner may just have lost faith that you're just full of bunkers, that your word doesn't mean anything. Um, 
I may have told you guys before, I, I, I've been keeping journals since 1998. And at the beginning of the year, I write at the beginning of the, the front of those, I would write out my top 10 goals for the year. And one year, this is about 2008, so my daughter would have been you know, 10 at the time, and she wrote, number 11, do what you say you will do. And when I asked her about this, she asked me, she said, you said you do this, she said, and these were, re these were promises I had broken, and I had lost her trust in me because it didn't matter what the excuses or explanations I had given her, I had lost the trust of a 10-year-old girl, my daughter, in what she had expected of me. She said, do what you said you will do. From that one sentence, I changed the, my schedule around completely to fit her in, and I now don't call anything I do scheduling. I, do, I call it scheduling. I do what I said, you, do what you said you will do. That's what I say it is now. So nothing on there is a wish, nothing on there is a might. You might have heard me say it before, there's no such thing as want power, might power, need power, could power, should power, nice power. It's willpower, not try power, willpower. Do or do not, there is no try, Yoda said. You want to reestablish trust with your partner or your children for that matter, do what you say you will do, do or do not. Don't put it as a nice to have or whatever, do it. That's it. Write it down, write it in stone, and take the first step. So you've put your plan in place. You then, if the purpose is to reestablish trust, understand the situation from both parties. Empathy is a completely different thing from sympathy. Sympathy is where you feel sorry for somebody. Empathy requires you to step back and look at the situation from the other person's perspective. Now, the couple that were here today, when she was complaining about her partner and not having giving her quality time, he was rattling off the time that he sets aside. And I said to her, well, is, that, is, is what he's saying true? Because you, you had the conversations, all that. And she said, I just don't feel heard. And I said, what does heard look like to you? And she said, well, heard looks like he's 100% into me, into me. Now, when I talk about intimacy later on, it is into me, see? It is into me. That's the intimacy. When the person, when you show that you are into your partner, not, hey, a little bit toey or whatever it is, and there is the environment within you which you've created. But in the understanding, when I said, so you don't feel heard, what does that look like? And she said, well, he could be tapping away. And he said, you know, no, but I am listening. And I said, here's the thing. Women can multitask. There is, that has been established well and truly. Men can't multitask. That has been established well and truly. The idea that, you know, you blokes ask me what books I read and I found a book today called Focus and I bought that book three times. The reason I bought it three times is because I lost it twice, but I actually never finished reading the book because I hadn't focused. I don't have a problem focusing. I have a problem choosing what to focus on and focus on it for that time. When I changed my approach to reading, I knew that I, I understood that I have to sit down and make a commitment to that one book from the beginning until the end. So from understanding, you've got your plan on how you're going to reestablish trust with your partner, understand the set and setting of that. Now, when, when uh, scientists or whatever study people are under the influence of different drugs, they do take in okay, into account set and setting. When you get your blood pressure checked, the doctors will refer to it as white coat syndrome. Sometimes your blood pressure is through the roof. Ten minutes later, they'll take it and it'll be down to stable because the set and setting has changed and you've relaxed a little bit. So when you choose when to talk to your partner, it has to be in where everybody is agreed and understand that the time is relevant. Too many women say to me, well, my husband, you know, he just never really listens to me. You know, he comes to bed and he's all really, really cranky. And I say, is your husband a uh, early riser? Well, yeah, he gets up at five o'clock. So by the time he's done his day's work, it's not necessarily that he's not listening to you or he's not into you. He's absolutely spent. He's been up for 16, 18 hours. So it's going to be very difficult for him to give you his 100% attention when he's either got his mind on today, tomorrow's uh, job or 
the big conversation he had in the boardroom that he doesn't want to bring home with you or the argument he had with this. So pick your moments. Now, I also talk about worry meetings. And I say, you know, Seneca said we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. So if you, and I do this, I book a 10 o'clock meeting every Saturday morning, 10 a.m., I lock one hour out of my calendar for me to have a worry meeting. What that means is throughout the course of the week, whenever anything goes wrong or, wor- or causes me a concern for worry, I write it on my worry list. And then I take this to my 11 a.m. So it might be right now, I go, oh, gee, someone's hit me up for that bill. And it's, due- well, okay, so I don't want to worry about it now. I'll put Barry's bill and write it on the list. Come 10 a.m. Saturday morning when I sit down and I go, right, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cross every single thing off this list that is completely out of my control. Then everything else on that list, I'm going to go, okay, what can I do about it? Now, curiously, 80% of the things that are left on that list that I can do something about don't bother me anymore. I haven't worried about them. But the things that I can do something about and are still of concern or worry to me, I do something about it immediately. I take the first step. So if I can make one hour for myself to have a worry meeting, and you know what, it's done by 10.05 or 11, 10.05, I've got 55 minutes to do whatever I like. So I have actually put quality time aside for that. Now, let's do the same with exercise. If you say you want to start training and you put an hour in the book to go to the gym, then your boss says, what are you doing at 11 o'clock or, or lunchtime? You say, oh, excuse me, nothing. Then you've just gone away with the gym. I say to my partner, the best thing I can do for you is look after me. The best thing you can do for you is look after me. Uh, <laughs> look after you. I really do like it looking after me. But similarly, if your number one client was American Express and your number two client was National Australia Bank and you had a meeting one o'clock on Thursday with National Australia Bank and you ring up Amex and say, hey, can we have a meeting? And they say, are you free one o'clock on Thursday? You wouldn't say, no, I've got a meeting with National Australia Bank. You'd say, no, I can't. What about two, three, and you would find a time. Similarly with exercise, you don't have to tell your client who it is, but you don't put yourself last. Now, of first importance being, uh, Johann von Goethe said, the things which matter most must never be at the mercy of the things which matter least. Trust is generally lost in a relationship because you have not made your partner feel that she, he, they, them matter the most. So in that case, case re-establishing trust is putting her at first importance if you said you will let's catch up and have a, can we have this meeting at three o'clock then nothing gets in the way now that's it understand that the, the time and the space is required to have an honest conversation now as i say trust being re-established is keeping that keeping that um commitment to your partner is how the trust will be re-established. Now, as we were nutting out today, the quality time, I, I had said, okay, so to the to the bloke, um, why don't you look your partner in the eye or your wife in the eye while she's talking to you? And he goes, well, sometimes she just walks into my office and I'm still working and she says, have you got a minute? And I say, and what do you say? He says, well, I say, yeah. And I said, well, you shouldn't because you said yes. So she trusts your answer and is Playing with the cards you've just dealt her. If you say to her, actually, no, I haven't, can I wrap this up? And in fact, what is it that you do want to talk about? Because I've got to finish this thought thread. And if she says, well, I'm really worried about Kieran, our son, because this and the other, say, okay, I think this is really is important to all of us. So I'm going to shut the laptop down. This is number one. I'll write a note, get back to what it was I was doing. The things which matter most must never be at the mercy of the things which matter least. And it's through that reliability that trust is re-established. So you understand each other on that level. So you've done the P as your plan, the understanding and the empathy. The R, as you know, from a purpose perspective, is review, renew, reset, and reframe. So you say, okay, let me have a look at the relationship. Now, uh, a fellow said a couple of weeks ago, his wife gets cranky at him and they have an argument and all that sort of thing. And I said, what night is date night? Um, um, when was the last time you bought flowers? Have you bought her flowers this year? So, again, at the beginning of the relationship, you probably did. 
at the beginning of the relationship, there probably was. Now, my 23-year-old daughter puts up on Facebook with her boyfriend, date night. And I always send him a funny thing saying, hey, you don't have date night, you're not married. Date night's every night when you're not married as youngsters. So the idea that you're in a relationship and you're not having date night, that just means that you actually haven't put a priority on date night, spending quality time with your partner. Now, quality time, some of you blokes might not like to hear this, but the idea of quality time with your partner is 7 to 14 hours a week. Now, you might think that's a lot. The average American household spends 70 hours a week watching television. Quality time, you know, you look at, uh, there's another television. I, I don't watch a lot of television, as it turns out. Um, to me, I, I schedule entertainment time. I don't watch television on my own. That's just one of those things. And I generally watch uh, funny shows. Entertainment is generally that and, and, and maths for, for obvious reasons. But there's another show called Gogglebox. And uh, there's a couple on the show, and I think they're still on. I haven't watched this year's or last year's season. But there's a couple on the show, and the bloke, uh, I don't know what he does, but he wears a high-vis shirt and he drinks his beer and she's got long kind of shoulder bobby and they, they both have a drink and they, they laugh a lot. And they seem really well melded, but to me, they look like brother and sister. To me, they look like mates. And that's great that they're mates, but then they'll probably complain about the lack of intimacy in their relationship. And they probably view watching television as quality time. And you know what? With kids, that's quality time does work. Sitting with your arm around your kids, watching SpongeBob or something like that, that's quality time. And laughing along with them. To children, that is quality time because, one, you're letting them watch television and, two, you're spending the quality time with them. Now, an hour watching television with your partner, that's not quality time as far as I'm concerned. There's no dialogue. There's no exchanging of ideas. There's no are we on the same page. And we change. We change as we get older. But the idea of reestablishing trust in a relationship is that you change and you have the same objectives. You're actually on the same page. Um, a couple I worked with years ago, uh, they had told me that they'd been to a marriage therapist and that the therapist had told me that, told them rather that they should pick up a hobby. And I said, so what did you both decide to do? He said, well, I, I, I've been playing golf and Kath has, Kath's taken up pottery. I'm, like, I don't, I don't, I'm no therapist, but I don't think that's where they were going with that. I think they probably wanted you to establish a hobby or things in common together. Now, after the conversation I had with this couple this afternoon, they had both agreed to go for a walk, at least for one hour a day. Now, that is really doable. And it's like anything. When I talk about discipline and morning routines, the first thing I do is I get out of bed of the morning is I put on the coffee machine, I pour my salt water and lemon juice, and then I go and have a cold shower. Now, it's straight under the cold shower because I'm telling me that I own this show. I run the show, and we're having a cold shower right now. If you wake up to yourself. Now, it takes as much discipline to get up early. The same discipline is required to go to bed on time. So discipline comes from the word to follow. Jesus had 12 disciples who followed him around. Self-discipline is you following you, being your own personal Jesus. You set the rules and you follow those rules, and that's how you stay on those rules or those habits, if you like. So if you're reviewing the relationship that you have with the purpose of renewing and rebuilding trust, look where you've gone wrong. Review, well, what is it? I had a couple. A woman say to me once, well, you know, every year for 20 years he sat in front of the television at 6 o'clock and drank six beers until I'd go put his dinner in front of him at 7 o'clock. I said, what, he put six beers away in an hour? And she said, no, he probably got through three in the first but then three in the next. And I said, for 20 years. And she said, yeah. And I said, when did you tell him you had a problem with that? Two weeks ago. I said, so for 20 years he behaved in a certain way that he thought was acceptable. She said, yeah. And I said, now... How do you think he's feeling? He's, he's shocked. People treat you the way you allow or teach them to treat you, right or wrong. So if there are ways that your partner is being with you that you're not happy with, if you haven't told them, then how do they know? And it's not about nagging. 
And I mean that from both ways. No one ever nagged their way into a loving relationship. No one ever nagged their way into an outcome that is positive and beneficial for both of them. Positive discussion requires, um, Nelson Mandela said, don't raise your voice, raise the level of your argument. And the idea that body language, 65% of communication is nonverbal. It's body language. If you're talking to your partner and she's like this, she's not listening. Or he's not listening. They're, they're all guarded. So we get to the R in the purpose of reestablishing trust. And from that perspective, the discipline required that you would put in place to start your day, review where you've gone wrong in a relationship. It's like going off the rails, get back on track by thinking, okay, what have I done? And ask your partner in this trusting special event that you created to reestablish trust, can you tell me the first day? Because it's not just now. When I say to you blokes, it's never the towel on the bed. When did the towel on the bed become the cause of all your angst? Because it's not that. What did I do? Well, you know what? It's when your father said to me, and you didn't defend me. It's when your sister said to me, you didn't this and you didn't stick up for me. It's when that happened and you didn't do that. It's when the girls did and you didn't do that. Which brings me to the next P in purpose is people. Now, when I said to a bloke the other day, um, okay, you're reestablishing trust with your, with your wife and it seemed to be going well and now it's gone off and you don't know what you've done, who are her friends? Well, this, this, this. Do they like you? No. Why not? Well, because of what I did. So your wife's forgiven you, but the friends haven't. No. What reparations or what steps have you made for the friends to be? Well, I've just stayed away from them. But they were friends, you were friends, everything, and you're back on track. You're reestablishing trust with my partner, yeah, but you've, you've still kept the friends at bay. Why? How is that going to serve you? Well, I don't like them for this, that, and the other. Have you told your partner that? Well, no, I haven't. Have you told your partner the reasons why you don't like them? Because what you're saying is very valid, but she doesn't know that. And, again, it's the empathy. It's the understanding. It's she doesn't know this because I actually haven't told her. So the P and the people in the purpose mnemonic is very, very important because particularly with marriage or coupling, sometimes you marry a family. Sometimes you marry the sister and her sister. You know, it's like those people are important and if they're important to your partner and they're not important to you, it's going to cause difficulties. If you said to your partner, okay, well, we've got this family barbecue on next Saturday and you go there and you fight with their brother, that's going to lose trust in your reliability, in your steadiness, in the truth. The truth will set you free. You promised you'd go and you promised you'd be a good bloke and you didn't. You had to fight because there was a trigger. So you've got to work out in your review and resetting what are your triggers and then avoid them or tell your partner when this happens, that makes me feel this way. Now, it's not all about blame. You ask the questions. What is it that I do that makes you feel this way? I never knew that. I never knew that. I never knew that when I do that, this upsets you. Now, as dads, um, we tell dad jokes. My partner said to me one day, well, you're not my dad. You used to be funny, but dad jokes aren't funny to me. You don't be your funny self. You've taken dad jokes into the world and your sense of humour now is pull my finger, this sort of thing. You're not as funny as you used to be. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because when I brought her home to meet my father, my father didn't want to meet her and he looked in the window and he said, what are you going to do when the looks fade? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, will you be able to talk to her when you're 80? And I said, well, Dad, she laughs at everything I say. He said, well, you better go and marry her then. Now, when I told her that, he, she said, you used to be funny. Now, the point of that is the evolution of what is funny and the identification of what is funny. Now, I had been given the warning signs on, they're not funny, I don't want to hear those jokes. And I would say, well, you just don't get it. What, or do you get it? Do you get it? And it's like, no, no, no. The humour was for children. I'm not the sun. And this is the other thing. When you look at the people in the, in the P pneumonic of planning, understanding, reviewing, resetting, renewing, reframing, and the people as a person, are you the person that your partner married? Or are you now just another kid? Are you one of the children? Have you become the big brother of 
the other kids. You know, the bottle shop ads say you're a parent, you're not a mate. Don't buy your kids alcohol until they turn 18. At my daughter's 18th birthday, I said, we're friends, we can be mates now, Maddie. I mean, you know, joking away, but how many of us just become one of the kids? And then mum's running the show. Mum's now, she's been working all day with these three kids. Now she's got the fourth kid that's come home and he's just as demanding. He just demands other things and expects that she can turn it on. We'll get to intimacy in a minute, as I said. Um, so understanding this situation, reviewing your setting, looking at the people and the person you've become, and then the O in your purpose of re-establishing trust is optimism. You have to have optimism that the trust will be re-established. And that is in the case that you come bearing your soul with an honest apology and with steps in place or, or the outcome of what it is that you want, and you have to have optimism. Otherwise, there's no point in trying. Most of life revolves around optimism. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. The idea that Viktor Frankl said the three things that survivors within the, the Second World War, excuse me, or the Nazi German, uh, I've just realised, I keep saying to you blokes that I don't eat, I've got to watch what I eat so I don't belch throughout these presentations. I think it's just the gassy water because I haven't eaten since about 11. But anyway, the idea of having optimism. And in every relationship, there has to be that optimism that you're going to make it to the finish line. And with that in mind, you are but you behave that way. James Milton said some people can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. And the idea that you look at your relationship as your heaven on earth, then you have to look at it from an optimistic perspective with the S of purpose being the solutions and the steps. So when you reestablish the trust or you're working towards reestablishing the trust because of the promises that you've made, the S in the, in the purpose mnemonic and the purpose of establishing trust is what can I do? So you, you, desire, you, you design the idea of how can I reclaim that trust? And the trust is, well, you could start by doing this. Now, the smarter men amongst you will take a notepad to this meeting and write those down. You will then write that down. And if you're journaling, as you're supposed to be doing, I, I understand and I tell everybody that should be journaling every single day. Plato said, thinking is the soul talking with itself. Journaling, we learn to think on paper. Journaling is where you connect with you every single day. It's where you plug in, you say, hey, it's whatever time it is. This is the date it is. This is how I feel. This is what's going on. I'm not getting on with my wife. I think I've lost her trust. We had a meeting. This is how we were establishing it. How am I going to keep that today? And you put the steps in place. And then you turn up. And then you turn up. And then you turn up. And in the trust mnemonic, the S is the steadiness. The steadiness. Steady, steady, steady. Patience and consistency are the same thing. Impatience is another word for inconsistency. The problem with this now and the, the idea that we don't have to delay gratification is we all want it now and we all want things to change now. Oh, but I did this for two days, bro. You did it for two days and you expect me to think and trust you and drop my guard? You didn't undo this overnight. It's taken a long time. Uh, Jacob Reese says it's not the first or the last blow of the sculptor's hammer that breaks the marble, but every single one. It's not the first lie or the second lie. It's not the first hangover or the second hangover. It's not the first missed whatever. It's every single one of them. The straw that broke the camel's back is why now your partner's gone, you know what, all bets are off. This is just, you know, whatever. Now, she may not be saying that. She may be showing that. The towel on the bed, the shouting, the whatever, the arguments, this, the lack, the cold shoulder, whatever it is, these are the I had enough. So you've got to go back to where did those, where you know, where did I lose that trust and how can I, what are the steps and the solutions? And then the E in the purpose is what is the most effective way about going about it. Now, the, first, the, the most effective way is communication. Communication is the solution to the world's problems. Now, the problem for, uh, they say the problem for around communication is the belief that it has actually happened. So if you haven't found you know, if you're a morning person, your partner's your wife or your girlfriend or your partner is an evening person, then that's not going to be the best time to bring up these conversations. And you have to establish a date night. Now, my parents were married 65 years. I'm one of 10 kids. The middle child, so I was a bit of an observer. 
my parents went out for dinner Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday night. Um, my mother, my father passed away in 2021, but my father, my mother told me I, had, I, I went up the mountains and I had dinner with her a couple of weeks ago. And now it's an interesting thing. I think I'm on the spot now, but it's not a bad thing to do with your partner. I went up the mountains and I took a, uh, a boom box and uh, a nice steak. And I know my, my mother likes steak. And I, before I even walked in the front door, I went around the backyard and I lit the coals on a Weber barbecue. Then I went around and I knocked on the door of mum. Hey, mum, how are you going? Started talking to her and I said, I bought a steak. She goes, just cook it in. And I said, no, no, I've been, ah, and I showed her the fire. Then I sat down and I said, mum, um, what's your favourite song in the world? And she said, your father used to bring me up and he would sing, put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. And so this is when he was courting her. And so my dad's Irish, romantic, and I played the song. Now, my mother's 86. It should be 86 in April. And she had this childlike look on her face. And then she said, oh, you know, when, my, when your father would sing this to me and then he'd, he'd take me to the dance. And I said, what songs would play, Mum? And she told me the next one. I put that on. Now, I got there at 7 o'clock. We ate the steak at about 9 o'clock, you know, and I'm sitting there. And at about 11 o'clock, Mum said, now, what do you want to listen to? Because this had been all about her. Now, she had talked of her childhood. She had talked about the first time she went here. And I'm just sitting I'm learning so much about my mother. I'm learning a lot about myself. And she said, what do you want to listen to? This can't all be about me. And I said, Mum, do you know what? I've had such a wonderful time. And I said, when, you, when I was about three or four, you would do the housework and you would listen to these songs. And there was a, she said they were called The Bachelors. So I put The Bachelors on and we went back into it. Now, what I'm saying, the idea that just popped into my mind is to sit down with your partner and say, hey, what's your favourite song in the entire world if you don't know it already? And put that on. Now, people say they don't have time or space or whatever to go out for dinner. COVID was a brilliant one. COVID for me was where restaurants still did takeaway. I bought a tablecloth from Amazon. I bought candelabra on Amazon. Probably less than 200 bucks for nice dinner, like restaurant, napkins, restaurant tablecloth, candelabra, lit the candles. We'd go into Queen Chow or, or Saki or whatever the restaurants were in Manly, and I'd pick up the thing and I'd put on the music, and that would be a romantic evening. It's, we weren't allowed to go out. So now if you can't get a babysitter or you have no family support, you could still recreate that. You go on Amazon. Uh, I say, if it takes a minute, begin it. The amount of times I send things to people and say, here's the picture, here's the Amazon. For some of my clients, I literally buy it on Amazon and send it to their address because I know they're such procrastinators that they won't do it. One of my clients said to me, oh, you know, I think I should look into some other spiritual texts. I'm really interested in the Bhagavad Gita. And I said, well, just buy it. Yeah, yeah I will. And I knew where she lived and I texted it. The next day she rings me up, oh, I manifested the Bhagavad Gita because it went. I, it took me less than a minute to buy the book, have it sent to her on Amazon for $14. She got it the next day. We live in such an immediate world when it suits us and not when it doesn't suit us. We never have time. Oh, we can't do this. We can't get a babysitter. We can't afford that. Now, let's just say you don't have to be getting dinners from phenomenal restaurants, but I'm sure you have a tablecloth in the house. I'm sure you can set the table. I'm sure you can surprise your partner by buying flowers and putting it on. Now, as I say, you're trying to reestablish trust. The first time you do this, she's going to be a little bit wary. The second time, still a little bit wary. It then becomes a habit, a very, very positive habit and a very rewarding habit. Now, the, the effort you go into to do that, all the while you're thinking of your partner. It'll be very difficult to be thinking nasty thoughts about your partner while you're doing nice things for her. It's what you're doing, what you're saying, and how you're making her feel. This is part of or one of the steps and the most effective. Now, to the favourite uh, part of the night or the conversation of the night as far as establishing trust is concerned. Now, if you're in a relationship where you haven't lost trust, where everything's going tickety-boo, but it's not as intimate as you would like it to be, if you follow all of those steps in that relationship perspective or the romance perspective, it's more than likely that intimacy will return or be established in some shape or form within your relationship. Now, as I said earlier on, 
Love and desire are two different things. When you talk about uh, the love languages, there are three things that uh, Esther Perel, if any of you fellows have ever heard of her, Esther Perel is a relationship coach. She wrote the book called Mating, uh, uh, Mating in Captivity. So when you ask me of the books that I read and what I would recommend, uh, I often say, what are you trying to achieve? And if someone says to me, well, I've really got a really bad time management, I recommend The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If people say, I've really lost my connection to the planet, I read, okay, read The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. The, the living in the now is how you reestablish your presence. Now, again, if you're living in the now and when you're with your partner and you let her believe through honest and trust that you would rather be nowhere else in the world but with her right now, it is more than likely she will feel loving and intimate towards you. Now, the biggest mistake, when I say Esther Perel, she said there are three things in desire. That is longing from time apart, sociability, and experiences. Now, the reason I generally don't have to write these things down was I wanted to make sure that how I was serving you tonight was from an understanding perspective and that intimacy is not just sex and intimacy is not lust. Intimacy is that into me. When, you're, when your partner says, wow, he's into me, I see that he is into me, then it's more than likely that intimacy will ensue. Now, you coming home from, from work and being the baby or being the fourth child, third child, second child, however children, many children you have, and expecting your partner to be able to turn it on like a tap when she's still in motherhood mode, then she's now got another child who's expecting her to be able to just turn it on. My partner says to me that, you know, no man was ever found dead with a vacuum cleaner in his hand. She believes housework is part of intimacy. She also says that intimacy starts, sorry, foreplay starts the moment after orgasm. There are so many men who, right, that's it, off it goes. The idea that they're in it for themselves. If you read into the expression, nice guys come last, it might have a little bit more relevance to you as well rather than the way that people have portrayed it is that blokes who are nice lose out in life. Now, there is a book called No More Mr. Nice Guy. I would recommend you read that because what you'll find in that book, it's not saying now you need to be nasty, you need to be whatever. It's actually saying that the idea of being a nice guy is that you stop being a man. Now, within a lot of relationships, a lot of my male clients I mean, a midlife crisis doesn't necessarily mean that you're halfway through your life. Some of my clients have midlife crises at the age of 35, some of them at the age of 55. Now, the ones at 35 are the ones that all of a sudden have gotten a bit of a responsibility at work. They now have staff that they've got to manage. That, that comes with a bit of anxiety. They have now gotten married. They now have a mortgage. They now have children on the way. There's a little bit more midlife crisis because now all of a sudden they're no longer Peter Pan. They no longer have people doing things for them. They no longer have a boss telling them what to do. They no longer have renting and beer buddy money and all that sort of stuff. Now they've got real responsibilities and they don't know how to handle it because they haven't been empowered. One of the things I say to a lot of dads about resilience is creating resilience in our children. You know, uh, this age of... It, Everything's immediate now. Your kid, your kid wants something, so you give it to them. Bruce Lee said, don't buy your children the things you didn't have. Teach them the things you didn't know. Materialism wears out. Knowledge never does. I see parents soothing their children with toys, a toy that never gets used after that moment. Costs you $25, that sort of thing. My oldest daughter is a psychologist. During studying to be a psychologist, she is an accomplished pianist piano player, and she was teaching, she was offering piano lessons. It got so annoying for her because she was literally babysitting kids for an hour. It was cheaper for someone to pay her $55 an hour than a babysitter who had the kids crying. Um, as it turns out, she's going to be using that psychology and piano teaching together. The parents don't know, or the children don't know they're being psychoanalyzed. They think they're being taught the piano. But the thing is, Music, piano, learning has been shown to calm children down, to allow them to focus 
and to see whether it is they do have ADHD, whether they do have behavioural issues. We live in a world now because of the pandemic that anxiety is rife, depression is rife, and all of this self-diagnosis because of the lack of socialisation that we had through COVID because we couldn't go out. Now, throughout COVID, um, the, the second part that Esther Perel talks about as far as creating desire is sociability. Our partners, when they see us socialising, if they see how other people react with us and are with us, it creates desire. If you are liked by your mates, if your mates show, see you and you are yourself, that's a desirable situation for your partner to see you in because that's who she knows. When you're out there with the boys and you're at a party and, you know, personally, I, I like, you know, uh, what do you call it, mingling with men and women. I've never really gone to the, to the barbecue and sat there with the boys because the boys are talking about car racing and sports and it's an easier thing. Eleanor Roosevelt said, great minds talk about ideas, average minds talk about events, and small minds talk about people. Now, we all move within those conversations, but there are some of us who can do nothing other than talk about other people because while they're talking about other people, they're not actually having to be accountable for themselves. The gossips of the world, hey, guess what Karen's doing? You know, it's because they don't have to be talking about themselves. Men are very events-based because, again, you're not really having to talk about your feelings. How about the, what about, uh, you know, the new manly coach? That's talking about that. Men will sit next to each other at sporting events because they don't have to actually eyeball each other. But you sit down and there's no greater person, I believe, you can have an ideas-based conversation with than your partner and you sit across the table from her and you have that conversation and you're looking in her eyes and you're listening to her, which is where the idea of um, experiences, which is the third thing that Esther Perel refers to as far as desirability is concerned, now, I say, to me, life is about meaning and memories. You create the meaning through the memories and the memories through the meaning. Now, what meaning and memories are to you is the amount of emotion that you put into it and the experiences that you create. So the experiences, as Esther Perel says, is the third level of desirability. Desirability being one, longing. So you talk about love languages. She's talking about desire love languages. So it's the longing and the time apart that when you do come home from, from work, your partner has missed you because when you left in the morning, you left her longing because of how you made her feel and what you said and what you did. Not like by love and we become complacent. Within a relationship, and as I say, within a relationship, you get the girl based on all those things you did and then the, 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 what is most attractive about love in its earliest days is the excitement. It's the possibility of rejection. It's the getting to know the friends. It's the meeting the in-laws. <clears throat> it's all these things that are different, that are experiences, that are memories, that have meaning to them. Then you become comfortable. Then there's certainty. Then there is no expectation because... She's going to be there. He's going to come home. It all becomes vanilla because you don't continue to create experiences. And so if life's about meaning and memories, you create the meaning through the memories and the memories through the meaning, what meaning are you putting into the experiences you are having with your partner? So something as romantic as creating a romantic dinner, going for a walk and asking your partner questions, excuse me, I won't drink any more water. And listening to her. Now, the listen mnemonic. Uh, anybody who wants, I, I'm still waiting on this book, of course, um, due any minute, but there is a chapter that I've written on communication and I have recorded the part on listening. Now, when you listen to your partner, this is the mnemonic you should follow. Feel free to write this down, but I'll send anyone who wants to send me an email, david at leeway.com.au. Send me an email asking for the listen chapter and I'll send it to you in written form or the recorded form. So a lot of some of us are readers, some of us don't have time to read. So you might listen to it on the way to work or on the way home from work. But in a nutshell, when you're talking to your partner, the L is look. Look in her eyes while you're speaking to her. Look for her body language. As I said, 
If she's like this, she's not listening. She's not buying anything you're saying. She's not convinced she can trust you again <clears throat> if the re-establishment of trust is your number one priority. Watch for the body language. Look in her eyes. The eye is ask her intuitive and imaginative questions. So don't just say, how was your day, dear? That's rubbish. Uh, my partner said to me, please stop asking me if I'm happy. Ask me how I'm feeling. And I thought, okay, how are you feeling? Happy? Dad joke backfired. Now I know how she's feeling. But it was a good question for her to ask me. But again, I had the communication. I asked for the feedback. It was an imaginative and an intuitive question. And when I asked her in an imaginative way, and I've told you, Rudyard Kipling said, I had six honest serving friends. They taught me all I knew. Their names are where and why and what and how and when and who. Now, when you ask the questions, you're listening for the answers. How did you go today? How was your day? Who did you talk to? You know, uh, when was this happening? What have we got coming up? Uh, one of the questions I asked the fellow the other day is, what holidays do you have planned for this year? Don't have any. Uh, this couple today, we're talking about, and she, she's saying he doesn't hear me, I don't feel heard, and she said, I want to live in this particular part of the world. <clears throat> and he said, well, that's just stupid. We know that's never going to happen. And I said, why not? And his answers were not realistic from hers. Now, before the night, before the afternoon, these are friends, before they left for the day, they're looking at realestate.com and they're going to look at a couple of these places. He had opened his mind enough because the S in the listen mnemonic is seek first to understand, then to be understood. When he asked his partner, why do you want to live there? She said, since I was eight years of age, that was what I was led to believe was wherever this place was because her auntie lived there, this, da, da, da. And I said to him, what is it that scares you about the place? Is it because it's an expensive area? And she said, I've only ever looked at the houses between this and that price because he said all those houses go for $13 million. She said, I've only looked at this and this. I said, can you afford that? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, why don't you? So anyway, they agreed to do that. So he had sought to understand and then to be understood. We talk at the dialogue of the deaf, putting over what you want. Oh, she never, my wife doesn't listen to me. I don't understand my wife. She doesn't listen to me. Well, what do you mean? I thought in, under, in order to be to understand, you needed to listen. So the T in the listen mnemonic is tame your tongue. When you ask your partner a question, shut up. Listen to the answer. I was a chatterbox at school. My kindergarten teacher used to make me sit there with my finger over my lip. Now, one of my body languages, which is so embedded, is that if somebody's talking to me and I'm doing that, it's because I really know I've got, I want to say something, but I need you to know I'm listening and I need to listen. So I do that. And it almost sets off a part in my brain that makes me listen. If I really want you to know I'm listening, I sit like this because I'm in a cafe and I want to block out all those other noises. It's a bit like, eh? but I can't hear exactly what that person is saying. And so I do that to show them I'm really focused in on that. The E is empathy. And empathy, as I said, is not sympathy. Empathy is, okay, I've come home with my story, but I haven't actually asked my partner how her day was. I had a fellow tell me once, so he came home and his wife hadn't unstacked the dishwasher. And my first question was, I said, so your wife doesn't work? And he said, no. I said, did your mother work? He said, no. And I said, right. So I'm just guessing, and the difference between a coach and a, a psychologist is that I don't sit there and say, how does that make you feel? I know how it makes you feel. You're here wanting me to help you get back on track. My job is to intuit where the problem is and ask you questions that are going to lead you to the solution and then hold you accountable to that solution. So by his behavior, knowing what I know about the way the world works, I said, did your mother work? No. So your wife doesn't work. No. So you think you're the big breadwinner and you come home and that dishwasher better be unstacked. Did you ask your partner why she didn't unstack the dishwasher? He said, no. And this was a very, very recent situation. And I said, why don't you do me that favor and find out why? And what about unstacking the dishwasher yourself? Again, possible foreplay. So he had done that. Now, the next time we caught up, <clears throat> the reason why she hadn't unstacked that top shelf of the dishwasher is because one of the children had slammed their hand in a door. So she forgot that she hadn't even finished that task. 
when with empathy he understood her situation, that's how he understood that. Now, as I said to him, what's to stop you unstacking the dishwasher? Who says roles are gender specific? Our programming. Quite often we want to be like dad. You know, the old cats in the cradle. Well, I'm going to be like you one day, dad. And the boy did grow up just like his dad in that he had no time for his father. Sometimes our parents are acting on models and scripting that they inherited from their parents. We live in a very different world. It's a very fast-paced and ever-changing world. We've got to reinvent ourselves. The fact that they're, I don't know, iPhone 14, whatever it is, it's continually. The, the idea I said, I said this, I uh, would have said this to you fellows, you know, it's setting goals is not about finding yourself. It's about reinventing yourself. Now, if you do feel that you want to set goals to find yourself, then set yourself some clues. And those clues are for your future self. Now, your purpose mnemonic and the plans for re-establishing trust and for finding intimacy within your relationship, put some clues down the line for future self and stick to those clues. <laughs> the idea being if in your, say, okay, writing a note for yourself, here's the list, um, the, can you put this in the oven? You'll find the lasagna in the freezer, put it on 260 for 45 minutes. Now, the next time I keep following those, if I don't follow that next time because I thought I could wing it and I burnt the lasagna or I didn't put it on 240 and dinner's not ready, I'm not following the script. Similarly, if you've agreed and had that discussion with your partner that you need to do the following things in order for her to be happy and reestablish trust and you don't follow those clues or those goals, then you're going to be clueless and you're going to be lost and you're going to continue to find other people to blame. If it is to be, it is up to me. Responsibility is your, your ability to respond. Responsible people respond. Reactive people blame. They say when you point the finger, there's always three pointing back at yourself. Anything you do has to start with yourself. Self-care. It's self-sabotage. It's not self-sabotage. It's self-deprioritization. In order to love and be loved, you have to love yourself. And you have to show that to your partner. Self-love is first love. It's not selfishness. It's self-preservation. Start looking after yourself from a mental, physical, spiritual, social, financial, family, business, and romance perspective. And the chances of intimacy, reigniting, or even being there in your life is a lot better, a lot more opportunistic than what it is at the moment.